Hey everybody, we are live, we're recording. Welcome to the webinar. Um, we are just getting set up. My name is Ryan, I'm hanging out here with Asher and David Hughes, who's gonna be presenting today. Um, how's it going, Asher? It's going well. Um, cool. it's, a, it's a beautiful day here in the Pacific Northwest. Nice. It's gonna be warm actually, but I, I, I shouldn't complain. And um, yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's a beautiful day right now. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just glad to be here. I'm actually I can see my garden right now, so I'm see all the work I need to do when I get done with the webinar. Now we've got Dave's <laughs> disembodied voice, but he probably has the most beautiful backdrop. Where are uh, you, Dave? Uh, Cortez Island, north of Vancouver on the west coast of Canada. Nice. Wow. And it is a gorgeous day here. That's awesome. Well, so uh, as we get started, so we're just going to take a minute and let some people filter in. It looks like we already have 78 people live. So welcome, wherever you're tuning in, whether it's, you know, pouring rain and muggy, humid or, or hot or beautiful, wherever you are, welcome to the webinar. I'm going to put on my uh, presentation here for a minute, so you should be able to see it. Um, let us know that you can hear okay, and also just tell us where you're tuning in from. Use the chat. You should be able to see the um, the chat down in the Zoom toolbar, and just say hi in the chat. Um, be great to to know that everybody can hear us okay. Um, let's see, I'll say hi too. There, so that's where the chat is. Jan, hey Jan, how's it going in Denver? Nice. Lexington, Kentucky, Covington, Massachusetts. Nadia calling in from New York. Great, awesome, cool. Well, everything seems to be working exactly the way we want it to. We've got a. a Good attendance, Vestal, New York. Oh, nice. That's not even that far from me. Um, I'm in I'm in upstate New York, southern tier New York, near the Pennsylvania border, uh, northern Virginia. Nice, Dave in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Director Frack Dallas, California. Wow. So we have people are attending from all over the place. This is amazing. So we have a great turnout. Um, we're really glad to have Dave here presenting. So. Yeah, this is my first slide, so thanks for, thanks for jumping on it, everybody. Um, just a couple of logistics here as we get started. So you're going to be able to use the chat to engage in real time. That's what the chat is for. But there's also a Q&A section, questions. You can add questions to the Q&A anytime you want to. What happens is it builds up a queue of your questions so that when we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar, um, you know, Dave is able to go through each of those questions and answer them. Um, you can also upvote questions. So look look them over and see if somebody already asked a question that you were about to ask, and then you can just upvote it. Um, if you have any problems, I'm going to be checking my email and watching the chat. So you can contact me, Ryan at healthharm.net, and I can try to troubleshoot for you access. Um, it is being recorded. So we're going to get this webinar um, set up. We're going to email it out to everybody who registered. So you know if something comes up, you're going to be able to watch the replay. So that's great. Um, so my name is Ryan. I'm part of the Health to Harm operations team. Health to Harm is a network. So essentially, we don't have a campaign. We're a network of a bunch of different groups. You know, when you're involved in it, your campaign and, and services and things that you want to offer, things that you're asking for, that's what the network is for. So as the op on the operations team, my job is to help run the technical side of these webinars, answer questions, fix things, and work with leaders in the network like yourself. So I'll tell you more about it at the very, very end, but you can also find out more on our website. And Asher Miller is here from Post Carbon Institute. We've been partnering to put together this presentation. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take it over from here, just explain a little bit about your work and how your work with uh, David Hughes came to be. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone joining us uh, for this conversation. Just a very brief context. Um, we at Post Carbon Institute have been working with David Hughes. He's, he's one of our fellows. Um, I'll introduce Dave in a second, but we've been working, gosh, I think it's been eight years now, Dave, um, sort of looking at what's happening uh, in, in shale plays with unconventional oil and gas production in the United States. And that all started for us, I think back in 2011, when we were hearing a lot of talk in 
sort of climate circles about, you know, shale gas being this bridge fuel, you know, from, from coal and, and other fossil fuels, you know, to a clean energy future. And, and there are assumptions, I think, being made at the time about it being quote unquote clean, but also assumptions being made about it, you know, its abundance. And there's a lot of talk, I don't know if anyone recalls this, but, you know, 60 Minutes had a special program talking about shale unionaires, you know, people who were making millions from shale production, you know, leasing their land. And this whole idea that we're having this revolution and there's gonna be this long-term abundance of, of oil and natural gas from fracking. Um, and we're a little, you know, hesitant about that and a little skeptical about that. So Dave actually did his first analysis for us back in 2011, just trying to understand a little bit um, of what was possible out there and looking at the production profile of these unconventional plays in comparison to sort of what we've known from conventional plays. They, they are very different geologically. Um, and that work, uh, you could see all the reports that Dave has done at, at shalebubble.org um, or at the postcarbon.org website. Um, that work has kind of morphed over time to looking a lot at specifically at the US Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration's work where every year they, they publish um, kind of an outlook of what they think the energy you know, picture is gonna look like you know, in the coming decades. And, um, and that was for us particularly worrisome when we saw them touting the potential of, of, uh, of oil in, the, in a Monterey in, in California, I'm talking about a huge amount of, of oil that could be recovered there. And uh, Dave actually did some analysis on that, showing that it was really, really uh, questionable, uh, the estimates that they came up with. The EIA then subsequently downgraded their estimates by 96%. Um, and uh, in, in the years since then, Dave has been sort of uh, doing this analysis every year, sort of doing a reality check on the EIA. And the reason the EIA matters is because as a government agency, um, they're really looked to by the mainstream media, by policymakers, the general public as sort of the go-to, you know, objective source of information about what we can, uh, we can expect in the future. And a lot of policy decisions are made based on that and investments made based on that. Um, so I really highly recommend people check out those reality checks that Dave has been doing. Um, I'll say very briefly, they're overblown in our estimation, you know, the, the estimates from the EIA. But we wanted to do this webinar specifically looking at um, the work Dave has done on the role of technological advances in these shale plays. Uh, because what we have seen through Dave's analysis of, of production in these plays is that there was uh, an impact of, of some of these technological advances, you know, longer uh, laterals in terms of horizontal drilling, more use of water and propent and other things. And we were really curious to see, okay, well, what kind of difference is this making and what could we expect? Um, so we, uh, we had Dave do this special kind of separate report from his, you know, annual reality checks. And uh, what he's going to talk about today is that. He's going to talk about kind of the results of that analysis. Um, and so I'm happy to turn it over to him uh, with just a, a very brief introduction. Uh, and I don't know if you have a slide up that you can pull up, Brian, with, with Dave's bio. But I'll just say briefly, um, Dave has worked for, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to embarrass him. Dave has worked for a long time in, in Canada uh, with the Geological Survey uh, for like three decades, looking at coal and, and oil and gas production there. Um, and, and as I mentioned, he, uh, he joined as a Post Carbon Institute fellow, God, it's been over a decade. Uh, looking specifically at fossil fuels and been doing a lot of analysis for us. Um, and the bio here uh, just shows some of the reports that he's been doing um, in that time. He's also been doing a lot of analysis specifically on the, on the Canadian energy picture. Um, and I really recommend, especially for folks that, that live in Canada, to check that work out as well. Um, and you can find all that at, at the Post Carbon Institute website. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll just turn it over to you, Dave, if you want to jump in to, to give kind of highlights on, on the report that you just did. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Asher. And thanks to everybody that's uh, tuning into this. I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, 
Uh, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, it looks good. I okay. think um, you can still go into presentation mode. Right. I'll just... Uh... Oh, Great. Yeah. So, as Ashur mentioned, I've been uh, pretty keenly interested in, in U.S. shale plays and, and fracking technology. And one of the things I've noticed is an improvement in productivity. If you look at, at these individual shale plays over particularly the last uh, six or seven years, and I wanted to find out, you know, why is that happening? So that's basically what this report is is about, uh, looking at uh, the changes in horizontal lateral length, uh, changes in water and prop in injection over time, and looking at the effect of that on uh, on productivity of these wells. So just a quick overview, uh, certainly the advent of horizontal fracturing coupled with horizontal drilling has reversed what appeared to be a terminal decline in U.S. oil and gas production. Back in uh, 2005, it looked like the U.S. was going to be dependent on LNG imports, and then fracking came along. Uh, Industries managed to increase production despite marginal or negative cash flow and low prices. And we've seen a lot of talk about basically a lot of the industry is, is cash flow negative and it's being particularly punished recently in terms of the stock, stock prices of some of these companies. But they managed to uh, grow production uh, over this period of time. Industry did this with increasingly aggressive technology and by exploiting sweet spots. So if you look at a shale play, all parts of it are not equal. And typically 15 to 20% of it is what you would call a very high product productivity sweet spot. And those, of course, are exploited first. Unfortunately, sweet spots are finite and there are limits to how much you can crank up the technology. So what I'd like to do is give you a brief overview of the report, the plays we looked at, the parameters that were analyzed, and uh, the overall results. I'll look at, at two examples, one tight oil play and, and one shale gas play. So I'd like to look at the back end, which is really where tight oil got started with fracking, and the Marcellus, which is the biggest uh, shale gas play in the U.S. at this point. Signs of limits, uh, declining well productivity despite increasingly aggressive technology. That certainly hasn't happened everywhere, but it has happened in some counties uh, and in some plays. What does this mean for the long-term uh, future? So I looked at 10 plays. Uh, these are really the top 10. Uh, they account for about 93% of, of production of oil and gas from shale in the U.S. If we look at what's happened in terms of, of producing wells, there's about 100,000 uh, producing wells that have been drilled since the beginning of of 2010. Uh, a lot of those are in the Permian, and 73% are, are in oil-prone shales. And part of the reason for that is that oil is worth about three times as much as gas on an energy equivalent basis. So a lot of the money has gone into oil. If we look at productivity, uh, we can see that the gas plays are generally more abundant than uh, than oil prone plays, and the oil prone plays, you know, like the Permian Basin, for example, also produce quite a bit of gas. So the Permian, Eagle Ford, um, 
produce a lot of gas along with the oil. The Marcellus in some counties produces a, a little bit of of liquids, but mainly gas. If we look at the growth in production of of shale oil or tight oil, uh, we can see exponential growth, really, a uh, slight downturn in 2016, and then that, that growth continued. 44% of it comes from the Permian Basin. The top two plays are 63% of production. So these plays are not ubiquitous. Uh, they're relatively rare. If we look at shale gas, we can see the same thing. Uh, extremely strong growth in production, but again, the Marcellus accounted for a third of U.S. shale gas production. The top two plays, the Marcellus and the Permian, accounted for 46%. So again, these plays are not, not ubiquitous. If we look at Drilling, how many producing wells have been added since the beginning of, of 2010? We can see the most aggressive drilling is really the Permian Basin, which we've all heard a lot about. And that's where a lot of the growth in, in oil production is coming from. Much less drilling in gas is on the bottom here. A lot of the money is going to the board is next, uh, followed by the back. And some, some liquids production from the gas plays down at the bottom. If we look at gas production from what else drills uh, you can see how the Marcellus uh, really dominates things. But the Permian, which is an oil-prone play, is number two in terms of gas production from shale in the U.S. Plays, uh, basically how much drilling is going on. If you look at plays uh, down at the bottom here, which I consider late stage plays, the Barnett, where shale gas really got started, at Vail Navarra, those are. Hey, Dave, Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your voice is cracking up a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sure. yeah, no problem. I just wanted to double check. Are you connected, your audio connected via phone, or are you doing audio through the computer as well? No, it's it's connected via phone. Okay, great. I think, um, yeah. So this is the first time that it's that it's happened. So I imagine, um, hopefully, it just stays as clear as possible. But maybe if it starts to break up. Um, is there anything that you can change or is that, um, do we just have to hope it stays clear? Okay. Maybe we can have Dave try to call back in. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. We can keep, keep everything rolling. Thanks everybody for... Uh, Baron with us here on the technical difficulty there. Um, a couple people are asking if we could jump back, go back just a couple of slides. Uh, okay, well, let me let me call in again. Just hold on. Great. Cool. Cool. Technology. So Dave actually. Uh, in the in the summer, he lives on this island in, uh, in British Columbia, where he's pretty much living off of uh, of solar energy, um, and so his uh, 
this connection is not always the best, but uh, it's uh, it's just part of what we have to live with. <laughs> no fault of solar, though, right? No, it's no fault of solar. I don't think I've been, I don't think solar is the issue in this case. But yeah, um, but yeah, they get they get some serious storms there sometimes. Yeah. Great. Cool. And we're seeing uh, we're seeing some comments from folks about going back if we can, um, and uh, and then maybe when Dave gets back on, he could just quickly. It sounds like folks are interested in seeing the map of where the plays are. Um, and while we wait for Dave, this is a time, I think, to iterate something that we mentioned in the email, which is that for everybody who's attending, you're going to be able to have access to the full report. Yeah, we'll, um, we're going to send an email out afterward uh, with a with a special discount code, uh, one time discount code for folks who are able to participate in this, uh, and uh, that will get you access to the to the report. Yeah, so if if folks aren't familiar with the report and want to look it up beforehand, you can go to postcarbon.org, and it's under the books and reports section. Yeah, one thing I'll maybe I'll just mention while we're waiting for Dave too, just uh, you could see on um, on Dave's chart, so the data is from uh, something called Drilling Info. And Drilling Info is, uh, is a service that actually a lot of the oil companies use and, and the US government uses, the EIA actually uses them as, as one of their sources of, of information. And what Drilling Info does is compile all the, the reporting data that comes from, from the states and, and provided by, by the drilling companies to provide, you know, as real time as we can get data on the production profile uh, in all of these places. So, so Dave has been able to go in with a license that we've gotten from them and really crunch the data himself. Some states are slower in reporting things, so there's sometimes a, a bit of a gap. I think Pennsylvania is one of those states that's a little behind. Um, mm. But you know, Davis had access to data on hundreds and thousands of wells um, that he's been crunching. Yeah, I'm I'm back here. Uh, thanks so much, Dave. Yeah, let's. We'll keep our fingers crossed, Dave. Um, we've had some um, some requests from folks. If you could just backtrack a little bit, um, sure. And and one of the first questions is maybe you could just go really quickly back to the map, just to remind people where these plays are that you're talking about. Right. So you can see this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, here, here's the the picture of the ten the ten plays. Uh, you know, ranging from Texas through Colorado, North Dakota, uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio, and the Fayetteville in in Arkansas. So Brent had asked about the Bakken, Marcellus, and Permian. So Bakken is the yellow at the top, Permian is the brown the bottom center and Marcellus is the green. Right. Yes. All right. Okay. You can roll on now, Dave. Thanks. Okay. I'm not sure. I left off here with the, the, the broken up phone uh, voice. Uh, do you want me to go back a couple slides here? So... Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, just really quickly, maybe. Yeah, okay. Yeah, ba basically just uh, a look at, at oil production from shale. Uh, Permian is number one with the strongest growth. Bakken and, and Eagle Ford have actually, uh, Eagle Ford is past peak. The Bakken has actually grown to exceed its peak, but, but pretty much flat. Uh, the, the Permian is really going up. And if we look at shale gas, we can see that the uh, 
Marcellus is, you know, by far the the biggest shale gas play, and an oil prone play, the Permian Basin is actually number two in terms of shale gas production. In terms of the life cycle of shale plays, I've classified them in terms of late, mature, and early stage. Early stage would be the Utica, in mainly in Ohio, but also extending into western Pennsylvania and northern uh, West Virginia. But three of these plays, the, the Barnett, which is where shale gas got started, the Fayetteville in Arkansas, and the Niobrara in Colorado are what I would consider late stage. Drilling is essentially stopped in the Barnett and the Fayetteville, and they're, they're basically in terminal decline. The Utica uh, early stage, so very aggressive uh, drilling in the Utica, and the rest of the plays fall into what I consider mature stage. So there, there's quite a bit of, of drilling that's being added. If we look at technology, uh, one of the things that's happened is an increase in horizontal lateral length. So if we look at the the back end, has always had lateral lengths uh, around 10,000 feet, but there's been an increase of about 44% on average over the last six years in terms of horizontal lateral length. So each individual well is accessing more more reservoir. And this is basically just the percentage change. Uh, you can see a, a huge growth in the, in the Utica. So horizontal lat lateral length in the Utica is, has doubled since 2012. And on average, uh, lateral lengths have gone up about 44%. If we look at the total amount of water that's injected into these wells, we can see a, a huge increase in both water and propane. The overall average increase is more than triple, uh, up 252 percent since uh, since 2012. The average well has gone from about four gallons per well to close to 12 million gallons per well over that six-year period. And if we look at the percentage increase in, in terms of water injection, you can see that the, the Permian has increased six-fold in terms of the amount of water that's going into uh, each well. And the overall average, as I said, is up 252%. If we look at water injection per lateral foot uh, to take out the uh, the increase in horizontal lateral length, we can see that the amount of water uh, that's going into those plays is more than doubled in terms of water per lateral foot. It's up 145% since 2012. Oil prone plays are up over triple, uh, 212%. And this is the the percentage change in water injection per foot. So the Permian is up fourfold since 2012. The Bakken is up more than triple. So if you combine horizontal uh, ladder length increases and increases in terms of the amount of water and profit that's being injected into these wells, the amount of of reservoir that an individual well can access has gone up a lot. So if you look at the Permian, for example, which is the, the line at the top, uh, an average 2018 Permian well accessed four times as much reservoir as the 2012. So basically a lot, a lot more uh, Reservoir access and hence more production per well based on the technological increase. However, if you look at the Permian, you can see that it's, it's flattened out, so they've really hit the 
law of diminishing returns uh, in the last year or so in terms of how much you can crank up the uh, the technology. So if you look at what, what that means in terms of the, the number of wells you have to drill in order to get a certain level of production, uh, you can see that basically 10,000 horizontal wells in 2018 can access as much reservoir as 33,000 wells in 2012. So, you know, the tech technology has certainly made a difference and has certainly uh, decreased costs per unit of, of production, which is why some of these companies have been able to stay in business. If we look at production per lateral foot, uh, if we look at the change in production per lateral foot, given the increase in technology, we can see that you know water production has gone or water injection has gone up a lot more than production. But there has been an increase in production in in several of these plays. On average, they're up about fifty four percent in terms of production per lateral foot, based on these great increases in uh, in injection of water and profit. And this is a comparison of the amount of water versus the production. So the the yellow and dashed lines and black lines are water injection, and the other lines are, are production per lateral foot. So for example, in oil prone planes, the black line, we've increased the amount of water that we've, we're pumping in by more than triple on average. And the production signal that we got from that is, is relatively modest in terms of the increased production. If we look at total water consumption by play, uh, in 2018, we're up to about 100 and 20 billion uh, U.S. gallons of water injection, and that water injection has doubled since 2016, and nearly half of it uh, has gone into the Permian Basin, which is a relatively arid uh, part of the U.S. If we look at major plays versus water consumption, per barrel of oil equivalent, we can see that uh, we've doubled the uh, water consumption per barrel of oil equivalent for, for oil. On average, we're up about 50%. And for gas, we're, we're about the same. So we're not really getting uh, a lot more gas for the water consumption that we're putting in. Just to run through a couple of plays to show you the parameters that we looked at in the report. Uh, this is the Bakken in North Dakota, which is really where uh, tight oil got its start. And the wells are colored by initial productivity. So the red wells are our highest initial productivity and the black wells are the lowest. And one thing you can see is that the sweet spots are a relatively small part of the total play. And those are, are being drilled off now. And after that, one has to move into lower productivity parts of the play. So if you look at the back end in terms of production by county, we can see that Two counties have produced 55% of the oil so far. The top four counties have produced 86%. Um, so really the sweet spots are, are what's being exploited now and wh where the productivity comes from. If we look at the improvement of technology uh, in the back and over time, we can see that in terms of 2012 technology right now, uh, the drilling there is equivalent to about 3,500 wells per year. But only a little over 1,000 wells per year are being 
drilled. So we're getting about a three to one uh, increase because of the technology. If we look at horizontal lateral links in the back end, we can see that there's quite a spread uh, converging around 10,000 feet per well. But some of the wells have, have exceeded 14,000 feet and, and some of them are, are much less. The increase in terms of lateral length by county over time. So back in 2008, just over 7,000 feet, and in 2018, close to 10,000 feet. If we look at water injection over time, we can see uh, quite an increase from less than 2 million gallons per well back in 2011 to around 8 million gallons per well today. But there's also a lot of variation. Some wells exceeded 20 million gallons per well. If we look at injection per well and per lateral foot, uh, the dash line is per lateral foot. And you can see that they're injecting close to 900 gallons of water per foot in those wells and a little over 8 million U.S. gallons per well. If we look at what that means in terms of, of, of propent, typically about one pound of propent is injected per gallon of water. So they're injecting close to 900 pounds of propent per foot. So that's a half ton truckload of sand for every foot of those horizontal wells. The uh, consumption per lateral foot has gone up about three and a half times since 2012. If we look at oil production per lateral foot, uh, it pretty much leveled off starting in about 2009, and it, it's increased somewhat uh, recently. And that's both because of technology and by focusing drilling efforts on, on the best quality parts of the play, the sweet spots. If we look at a comparison between water injection and production, so the blue line is, is water injection, how much it's increased, and the other lines are, are productivity per lateral foot. So we've cranked up the, uh, the water injection by a factor of close to seven, and we've got a maybe a 50% increase in terms of productivity. If we look at production by county, the, the black bar here is the average for the whole play. We can see that productivity was declining up until 2012, and then it, it started to increase with the uh, radical increase in, in prop and injection and uh, increasing the horizontal lateral length. And this is productivity uh, by county. Uh, for different time periods, and in essence, uh, we're up about 50% on average due to the increase in, in technology. If we look at what comes out of those wells, uh, in terms of oil, gas, and water, we can see that the, the amount of formation water that's come out that has to be re-injected has increased a lot. Uh, Water production is up about 541% since 2008. Gas production is also up, and oil production is up much less. If we look at the percentage of oil that comes out of those wells, back in 2008, 75% of what came out of a well was oil, and in 2017, that number is down to 25%. So all in, increased water production is an extra cost in terms of, of having those of it. And gas is not worth much compared to oil. If we look at the Marcellus, which I know a, a lot of your members are, are keen on what's happening in Pennsylvania, 
we can. This is the, the same map I showed you for the the back and the red wells are really the highest productivity wells. And there's a a big sweet spot in northeastern Pennsylvania, the Susquehanna and Bradford counties, which is where the Marcellus really got started. Another sweet spot in in southwestern uh, Pennsylvania and northern uh, West Virginia. And the thing about the southwest part of Pennsylvania is that there's also liquids produced. So not not that much, but but significant amounts. And we've seen a a giant cracker plant that's being built uh, just north of of Pittsburgh, and basically it's using uh, the liquids that are produced in Washington County, Greene County, in southwest Pennsylvania. If we look at Marcellus production by county, we see the same picture that we saw in the Bakken. Uh, a few counties produce most of the gas. The top two counties in this case uh, produce about a third, uh, Susquehanna and Bradford, and the top five produce 62%. The, the Marcellus is a very big play. It covers a lot of counties, but the, uh, the top counties are relatively few. If we look at the impact of technology in the uh, Marcellus, we can see that today the equivalent of 3,000 2012 wells are being drilled. However, the actual number, because of the increase in technology, is only about 1,400 per year is the current drilling rate in the Marcellus. If we look at horizontal ladder length, uh, same thing, we've seen a big increase from about 2,000 feet back in 2008 to around 8,000 feet today. Some of the wells have actually gone close to 15,000 feet, but the average is around 8. This is the increase in horizontal lateral length by county. So we're, we're up from 2,000 to close to 8,000 feet. If we look at water injection in the Marcellus, we can see that some wells injected more than 30 million gallons of water. On average, uh, closer to 14 million gallons, but that's increased from about 4 million gallons back in 2011. If we look at it, at total water injection and injection per lateral foot, we can see that total water injection per well is up 2.75 times since 2012, and water injection per foot is up not quite double to about 14 to about 12 million gallons per foot and close to 14 million gallons per well. If we look at the amount of propent that's going into those wells, again, roughly one pound of propent per gallon of water, we can see that roughly 2,000 pounds of propent are being injected per lateral foot. So propent is up 1.74 times since 2012. If we look at, the, at what that's done to production per lateral foot, it's been essentially flat, uh, and actually production is declining per lateral foot uh, in the last couple of years, even though we're increasing the amount of water and propent that, that's going into those wells. So a lot of diminishing returns in terms of technology. This is a comparison of, of <clears throat> water injection, which is the the thick blue line, and production. And if we look at production over the first 12 months and 24 months, it's actually negative. This is a very interesting chart. This is productivity per lateral foot by county. And you can see the black is the average for the whole play. 
So productivity per foot peaked in about 2014, and it's declined since for the whole play. But if we look at the top county, which produced a quarter of the gas in the Marcella, Susquehanna, we can see a very steep drop-off in productivity. Productivity is down about half since 2014. And that, that indicates basically they're getting to the end of drill, drillable locations. And in fact, there could be interference uh, in some of those wells. So drilling wells too close together calls, causes what's called a frack hit. And one well cannibalizes the production of another well. And that's happening clearly in the Marcellus. And uh, it'll eventually happen in all plays. Productivity over time uh, for different periods. You can see uh, what's happened in Susquehanna <clears throat> down about 50% uh, despite the technology. This is the Eagle Ford. Um, the only play that I've really seen in terms of tight oil, uh, basically illustrating the law of diminishing returns in terms of productivity. And if you look at, at the black, so the heavy black is the amount of oil produced on average for the first 24 months of production. And you can see that even though the technologies got better, the productivity at 24 months has fallen. The productivity at 12 months, which is the medium gray bar, has fallen as well. Productivity at six months has sort of, has fallen, but then it's sort of flattened out. So that means that you know the technology could be recovering more oil quicker up front, but in terms of the longer term productivity and the ultimate profitability of those wells, uh, it's declining markedly despite the technology. And again, this is the only play I've seen this so clearly in, but it will happen in all plays eventually. So just to wrap up, uh, looking at these 10 plays, we can see that plays like the Barnett and Fayetteville are in terminal decline. Sweet spots are, have exa been exhausted. In essence, drilling has nearly stopped. So they're pretty much finished. Productivity in the Marcellus overall is declining despite more aggressive technology. And productivity in the top county is declining rapidly. Eagle Ford productivity is also falling despite more aggressive technology. These productivity declines are due to the exhaustion of sweet spots and well overcrowding, which will eventually happen in all plays. High decline rates mean continuous drilling to offset field declines which are up to 45% per year. So if you didn't drill a well, uh, those fields, the production from those fields will decline by up to 45% per year. To maintain production, drilling rates will have to increase as sweet spots are exhausted and wells are sited in lower quality rock. So the wells cost the same amount to drill. It's just that productivity is falling off because you've, you're outside of the sweet spots. Prices will have to increase to make drilling lower productivity wells possible. The illusory goal of American energy dominance is doomed in the long run, just basically by the geology of these plays, despite the, the hype. A sustainable energy future will be a major challenge, but pedal to the metal shale extraction is certainly not the way to achieve it. So that's it. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, David, for doing the presentation just now. I'm going to pull up the Q&A right now. And uh, looks like we have 17 questions already in the Q&A section. Um, I see a couple of people raising the, 
raising their hands, but just the best way to do this is to put a question into the Q&A. Um, that'll be perfect. And I can read them off and then, uh, and then David, you can answer. Sound good? Yeah, we just one at a time. Great. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Great. Yeah. And we, we have about 10 minutes left in the schedule. So if, um, you know, if, David, if you're willing to go over a little bit, that's fine with me, but I just want to, I always want to acknowledge the schedule so we can stay on time. Um, sure. And uh, thanks Rick, who says awesome presentation, <laughs> sending his thanks in the chat. Um, so uh, I'm just going to go through the questions and, and they might not follow any particular order, but we'll just start right at the top here uh, from Rob, who's asking uh, the discussion flips between referring to, you know, basins and plays. And what's the difference? Can this be explained? Uh, I, sorry if I, I, I confused anybody, but uh, uh, you know, if you look at a big play like the uh, the Permian, uh, you know that that play has actually got a couple of sub basins in it: the Midland Basin and the Delaware Basin. Uh, but the whole thing is is collectively referred to as a play. The the other plays are pretty much confined to a single basin. Mm -hmm. Great. A question from Brent is asking, uh, regarding wastewater generated by hydraulic fracturing and drilling, what is the best disposal method? Has anyone researched and developed carbon filters such as charcoal mixed with cellulose to bind and purify water before disposal. Uh, I I think if 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 it's disposed, it, it it's not treated before it goes into the disposal wells. Some of the water is actually being recycled, so that that water is likely um, cleaned up in some way, so it can be reused. But if it goes into a disposal well, I doubt that it would be treated in any way. Um, we have uh, a question from Christopher who's asking, what is the IEA projecting at this time? Or the EIA? Yeah. Yeah, the, the IEA is the International Energy Agency in Paris. The EIA is the, is the projections that I've been using. Uh, they're, they're basically wildly optimistic. You know, these plays are going to you know, grow productivity in terms of oil at least through 2030 at relatively modest price increases. And shale gas will will keep growing, uh, flattening out, you know, once you get into the 2030s, but still being, you know, producing a huge amount of gas in 2050, uh, which implies that there's a lot more left, you know, at that point. And frankly, I, I regard those as extremely optimistic and highly unlikely to be uh, achieved in reality. Mm. Um, so we have a, a question uh, from Bruce who says, maybe this is beyond your purview, but why on God's green earth are people still investing such money losing ventures as shale oil and gas? Art Berman's most recent numbers show 71% of tight oil producers are losing money. Well, I, I think Art would probably tell you the same thing, is that the, the companies are paying fairly large dividends on, on those uh, shares. What, what's happened in the last 10 months, though, is share values have cratered. And... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of investors have pulled out. But, uh, you know, the big reason is with, with zero interest rates uh, and and dividends, considering that they're high-risk stocks, the dividends are, are what's been attracting investors. Although that, that party might be over. Okay. Um, John's wondering if you have before and after photos of fracked areas. 
Uh, well, there's lots of after photos <laughs> if you look on the uh, on the internet, including the one that's on the cover of the report, which mm. everybody that signed up will get a copy of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can probably go back into history on in terms of Google Earth and uh, get a get a picture of what some of these areas looked at looked like before. History is a really good feature if, if anybody hasn't used it on on Google Earth. Mm. Mm, yeah, the history feature there. Great, thanks. Um, Rosemary is asking how much of an increase in Marcellus is from zipper fracking versus an increase in propent or lateral length? Uh, I'm not sure what she means by, by zipper fracking. Cool. Yeah, so Rosemary, if you have any clarification, you can put that in the chat. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the number of fracking stages has gone up, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of these wells probably have 30 or 40 individual frack stages and you know so the number of stages has gone up as well as the amount of propping and water that's going into each one mm. yeah great so mark is wondering if you have a forecast for idaho oil and gas production sorry do you want to repeat that Here's yeah that. Do you have any forecast for Idaho oil and gas production? Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think that there's a lot of production in Idaho. It's it's a pretty small player in terms of the overall scheme of things. Okay. And uh, Rosemary just came back with a clarification. Zipper fracking is running laterals very close together to get as much out as possible, and it was uh, cited as a cause for. Uh, frack quakes in Pennsylvania. Yeah, well, it would, you know, frack frack quakes can uh, can happen with any well, but drilling wells too close together causes what's called frack hits, and that basically the the fractures from the two wells interfere with each other. Mm -hmm. So even though you might get the gas so quicker. You're you're really compromising the profitability of those wells because they're each well costs the same amount to drill, but they're producing a lot less because they're basically interfering with with each other. Mm -hmm. So we a really bad idea uh, drilling too close together, and yet that's happening. You know we've, we've seen it in the mm -hmm. Eagle Ford, we've seen it in the the Permian. I think it's certainly happening in the Marcellus in Susquehanna, which is why we're seeing the productivity decline. Great. Um, there's a question. Um, have you heard of the New York State drillers trying to get around the ban by using gelled LP instead of traditional fracking fluids? How likely is that to bust open the New York market? Uh, good question. I, you know, fracking is fracking. You know, basically, we're talking about drilling impermeable rock, and the only way you can get oil or gas out of it is by breaking it up with really brute force. You know, whether it's gels or whether it's water, and prop it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I wouldn't think I don't think it would work unless they really, uh, you know, cranked up the volume of what they're putting into those rocks to break them up. So I, I, I would probably say no. I don't think you, you could get around it that way. <laughs> cool. So um, real quick before we before we jump into um, other other questions, I want to give sort of a public service announcement about the webinar. Um, so we are going to be uh, sending out a link to the webinar replay after we wrap up the Q&A. Um, well, actually, we've got to process the video first. But part of this, you'll also have um, the opportunity to uh, access this report. And um, so we'll give you a like, coupon code and things like that. So huge thanks to uh,
Dave and uh, Asher and Post Carbon Institute for making that happen. Um, we also are going to talk a little bit more about this whole situation where there's uh, a rosy projection. There's an overestimation of what's possible, all these promises of jobs and economic growth and you know that aren't true and having the facts to really support that. So trying to think about, you know, if you're attending the webinar right now and you want to connect with um, Halt the Harm Network, if you're looking for support in your campaign, if you're working on a campaign currently, like with maybe the Appalachian Storage Hub, right? Maybe uh, the Cricket Valley Power Plant um, Project in New York State. So whatever your campaign is, can please connect with me and let's talk about that. But let's also, um, we're going to be announcing a way for you to get some support and getting some specific data around the campaign that you're working on. So more coming that way via email. So look out for it, please. But also take a minute and check out, um, yeah, this is the, the last bit here is I'll, I'll send you a brief survey, but also check out shalebubble.org, postcarbon.org. And um, I'll be also inviting you to join Health to Harm Network if you're not already a member. So you can have a profile in the leader directory, but also access all the services Webinars is just one of the services that's provided through the network. So that's my that's my end of webinar announcement, and we can get back to some of the questions here. Um, you know that Dave's willing to take a moment to answer. So, you know, if if it's two o'clock and you've got to jump off, I just want to thank you so much for coming and being part of the webinar today. So I know a couple of people are going to leave, but stick around for some of these uh, some of these questions. So, um, Dave, we have a question from uh, Ted Glick. He's asking, how long till all of this is over? That might be the, the question we're all asking. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, pretty good question. Uh, you know, and really, how long until it's over depends on how much money and how much drilling they do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to the re report, uh, called Drilling Deeper that I did in 2014. I looked at different scenarios. So I, I looked at the productivity of by county of the plays. And then I made different assumptions about how fast you drill. You know, the faster you drill, uh, because you, you have to keep drilling, otherwise that 45% decline per year will, will catch up to you very quickly. Uh, the faster you drill, uh, the shorter the life of these plays. You know, if if you drill slowly, then you can project things for a little bit longer. But I think the uh, the EIA forecasts are, you know, if I wanted to use an adjective, I'd say wildly <laughs> optimistic. You know, th those won't happen. So, you know, I think we'll see a wind down. Um, you know, depending on the amount of investment that that goes into these plays, certainly starting by late next decade, and then probably winding down from there, and prices are going to have to go up a lot, which is going to make alternatives like renewables, you know, look look a lot more attractive. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm. I'm curious also just, you know, because it's clearly there's a lot of, there's a lot of data and there's so many different details. So is it fair to say that like, you know, when we talk about the oil and gas industry with their projections and saying, oh, it's going to bring all these jobs and, and so on and so forth. Is it, is it mostly, are they still doing this mostly because they can just make some more money? I mean, even if the cost of doing it is going up and up and up, I mean, is it just like the industry? I guess, are they making money just because they're doing it, even if it's requiring more energy to get it out than they're actually producing? Well, yeah, you have to look at who's who's making the money. And certainly yeah. the executives in these companies are making money. Uh, you know, that's that's a given. So they have an incentive to keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, the investors are getting tired. 
and stock prices are going down. And it, really, the investors, you know, you need that money. You need that cash flow. You've got to keep drawing. Otherwise, you know, production falls. Uh, you know, I've, I just did a, some work in Canada. And, you know, we hear the same hype. Well, you know, we've got to do it. Otherwise, you know, look at all those jobs. But I actually looked at, you know, if you look at oil sands, for example, and you look at the, the productivity per worker, so the amount of number of workers has declined. The productivity per worker has gone up 61%. So they're looking at artificial intelligence. They're looking at every way they possibly can to cut jobs. Right. And if you look at you look at fracking, same thing, right? Um, you know, the number of people working on a rig has gone down a lot, uh, basically because of automation and right. artificial intelligence. So, you know, industry might might use that meme uh, on jobs to make itself look good, but they they could care less about jobs. In fact, the, the more they can cut jobs, you know, that just increases their profitability. Mm-hmm. So, that, you know, that's what they're looking at. Right, right. Great. Um, there's a question from John that says... Uh, your reports have shown production declines in fracked wells. Do you have decline rates in conventional wells for comparison? Uh, I haven't, you know, I haven't published any of those, but but typically they're lower. And, you know, a, a typical shale gas well, you know, depending on where you are, but the three, the first three years decline rate is between 70 and 90%. Um, Conventional would be would be less, and you know once typically the declines are are, hyper, are hyperbolic. So the you know the, the early years declines faster than later years. You get into what you call a terminal decline. Uh, so maybe after you know ten years, the wells are only declining from a, from a very small production level compared to what they were initially. But they may only be declining ten or fifteen percent, and the you know the long term life of a conventional well you know it would it would produce more in the later years than a shale gas well it, they tend to deliver their their resource quite quickly and then they're gone mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. great um there is uh, there's a question, there's a couple of different questions about water. Um, so one of them is, is the ratio and increase between water use and production similar in all plays? And there's another question that's may, maybe similar, is the increased amount of water production in direct relation to the amount of water injected? Or is it produced water or fresh water from within the shale? You know, typically when you when you frack a well, maybe thirty percent of that water comes back, like in the first week or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the longer term, it's pretty much all formation water. So it's not it's not injected water; it's it's formation water. Oh, okay. And, you know, some of the some of the data on that is not that great. Uh, the back end, you know, has really good data on water production which which I showed you and you know water production has gone up over 500 percent mm-hmm. uh, we're in terms of water production per lateral foot um, some of the other places it's not not that clear just because the data is not very good mm. yeah, there's another question about just like in cases where water um, is brought in, where does it come from? And does the industry have to pay for it? Well, I, I, I certainly think they have to pay for it. You know, a, quite a lot of that water is, is trucked in. So if you have a, a 10 million gallon well, that's, you know, 1,500 water truck uh, deliveries uh, to get it to the well. You know, in some cases, they do have a water pipeline. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but typically, that would be groundwater or or surface water drained from you know surface lakes and and uh, and containers or pumped from wells. And and as I mentioned, some of it is being recycled. Uh, so they can take the produced water, clean it up a bit, and uh, and reuse it. But a lot of it is just, you know, coming from groundwater or surface water. And I'm certain that they have to pay for it. You know, certainly to get it delivered, and likely, uh, you know, even to source it initially. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. Sort of um, question that dovetails on that is, uh, uh, Dari is asking. Is there a process that cleans the water? So, you know, because recycled water, quote unquote, is often taken to community wastewater treatment plants and then deposited into local waterways, basically not clean. Uh, Contaminants also being land applied in municipal sewage waste, but obviously not clean. So is there any way to actually clean the waste? Well, I'm I'm sure there is, but it costs money. You know, it's all a question of economics. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there are technologies that you could use, but they're likely to be expensive, which yeah. is why companies, uh, you know, stick it in disposal wells or get rid of it, you know, in other ways. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, there's a question, uh, Coralie's wondering, how much gas is left in the Susquehanna and Bradford County area? Shipping of LNG is going to be allowed down the Delaware in just two years. They're already shipping N, uh, NGL and LPG. So any comments on? And I think maybe this question ties into the larger question too of like big infrastructure projects being built as if we have 100 years or more of production. So what's, the, what's your assessment on that? Yeah, well, uh, certainly there's gas left in Susquehanna and Bradford, but it's getting getting to be pretty expensive. I mean, the productivity of the wells is going down, and the wells cost the same amount to drill. So you have to have higher prices, and that's what what I certainly see down the road. I mean, the Marcellus is a big play, but the sweet spots are quite small, and you know, prices are going to have to go up. Uh, building a lot of this infrastructure, I mean, we know that it's uh, catastrophic in terms of climate change. Mm-hmm. A new paper was just published uh, by Cornell today, Bob Howarth, on new estimates in terms of fugitive methane coming out of, of fracked gas plays. Uh, so, yeah, it's a catastrophe in terms of climate and you know, building a hundred years worth of infrastructure really, really doesn't make any sense, you know, what whatsoever. If we're serious about climate change and uh, and you know, really trying to mitigate that, the the EIA forecasts, optimistic though they are, are, are a disaster for the climate looking forward. Mm-hmm. You know, if if they prove right, which I don't think they will, but. Mm-hmm. I've just posted a um, just posted a link to that article, uh, Bob Howarth, in the chat that you just mentioned, Dave. Great. For the new study, I mean, that you just mentioned. Um, so thanks for that. Um, all right. Well, we we still have questions, but we have to start wrapping up. And so I'm gonna just go to a couple final questions that people have upvoted. Um, one of them is from Tim is, how long do you see the shale oil increases occurring in the U.S.? Uh, Well, again, it depends on how much money you put into the place and how fast you drill. Uh, You know, I I think we probably have a few years to run yet. Uh, At at current levels, you know, if you look at the the shale report that you're going to get, currently something in the order of 70 billion per year is being spent just on drilling. You know, that doesn't include other overhead. Uh, Mm. And a lot of that money is coming from investors. And investors are, 
are getting skittish. So, you know, if if the money has to, you, know, you really have to crank, you know, fifty billion a year into those plays mm-hmm. in order to keep growing production. Uh, so, if you continue to do that, maybe up it to sixty billion, uh, you could probably grow production for another three or four years. Mm-hmm. But you know, that's looking tenuous. Uh, terms of being able to keep that going, give an investor confidence. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, so the last question to just touch on here is, um, uh, what are the E-R-O-E-I is for these plays? So forgive me if I don't know what that acronym means. Uh, it means en- energy, energy return on energy investment. Ah, gotcha. Oh, yeah, awesome. and uh, I know that acronym. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a real buzzword in some circles. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's been some studies. Uh, Brandt, uh, I think he's at Stanford. Adam Brandt has done some pretty good work on ERO EI of shale. And really, you know, it depends on where you are. If you're in, you're in a sweet spot, I think it's probably fairly high. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's been some estimates, you know, 20, 30. Uh, if you're in a, you know, marginal part, it would go down accordingly. Mm-hmm. So really, it depends on, on where you're at. But there are, there are some papers out there. Brent probably has published the, some of the better ones. Great. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. So if you had a question and we didn't get to it, I'm sorry that that we ran out of time. I did my best to choose the questions that we could have answered at the moment. Um, But please, you know, feel free to stay in touch. One of the ways that you can ask questions is to, and actually let me just show you, um, we set up a website with... um, Halt the Harm Network. We partnered with the Fair Shake Legal Collective, Environmental Legal Services, and with Mountain Watershed Association. And we put together this help center that's called the Fracking Help Center. And it actually, if you go to a bunch of websites now in the sort of, um, you know, in the network, so Frack Tracker, Environmental Health Project, Mountain Watershed, um, groups like Protect PT are also doing it. And maybe you have a website and you want to do this too. You can actually add this little um, help widget. And the point here is that you can ask a question. So some of the questions that came in from the webinar, you can actually ask them here. What that does is it opens a support ticket that um, a group of volunteers from these different organizations are actually able to weigh in and respond. And so we're actually creating new help Um, articles like these ones, like, you know, water contamination, mortgage impacts, you know, rights as a leaseholder. All of these articles are being put together in response to questions. So the more questions that come in, the better this resource becomes for everybody. And, um, you know, and like I mentioned, you can find it here on our website. You can find it on other websites that are using it. And um, you can ask your questions and find answers and connect with me as well through the chat on here. So that's my sort of final announcement for people who still have questions. We really want to try to support uh, everybody who is working to protect their communities or take a stand around oil and gas issues to have access to this data. So please check out the Fracking Help Center and get in touch with me. Thanks, Deb. I'm glad you liked that. Um, So it looks like there's a lot of thanks in the chat for you, David. So thank you so much for your time today. And um, Yep. Can I just jump in real fast, Ryan, and yeah. just say thank you guys for, for hosting this. Um, and I really want to thank Dave for all the work that he, do, he does. You, uh, you guys probably cannot imagine the spreadsheets that, that Dave has compiled and the, uh, the countless hours that he spent doing this analysis, which is just not available anywhere else, really. I mean, this is why we continue to do this work. Um, and I think for me, I just want to reiterate for folks a big takeaway um, that I hope we can all remember, which is that we're talking about a depleting, re- these are depleting resources. And 
uh, the fact that we're doing this kind of level of intervention to try to keep uh, growing oil and gas production, at some point you just can't do it anymore. We're, there's a lot of conversation about whether investors will, will get gun shy or not. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the party has to come to an end. Um, and even we're starting to see with some of these, these extreme interventions with water and profit use and longer laterals and all that stuff, um, it's just uh, trying to prolong the, you know, uh, an inevitable reckoning. And especially when you consider the climate impacts of these things and the investments being made, it's kind of insane. Um, so we hope for folks who are, who are questioning, you know, these investments and, and the impacts of them can try to keep in mind and raise this question all the time when we're having conversations with folks, whether it's local media or policymakers or whoever it is, our neighbors, you know, um, is it is it worth these kinds of interventions when we either have to leave fossil fuels or they'll be leaving us? You know, so that's the only choice here. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to re reiterate at least our perspective on that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And uh, you'll be getting emails soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll we'll send all the links and, and follow up. You can check out the report. All right. Take care, everybody. Yeah, you. you too there, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, Dave. It's been good.